Uh, hi everyone, welcome to Data Umbrellas webinar. Uh, today is going to be a very interesting and popular new language. So welcome all. I'm going to do a brief introduction about Data Umbrella, then I'll hand over the mic and camera to Bruno, and then we will open up for question and answer at the end. This webinar will be recorded and it will be uploaded on our YouTube channel in the next 24 to 48 hours. And Data Umbrella is a community for underrepresented persons in data science, and we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, behind the umbrella, we have a team. Here with me is Reshma, who is a statistician and data scientist. You can find her on Twitter, LinkedIn, and GitHub as Reshma S. And I am Beryl Canali. I'm also a statistician and data scientist, and you can find me on Twitter as Beryl Canali. We also have a, co a code of conduct, and we are dedicated to providing a harassment-free experience for everyone. And we thank you for helping make the Umbrella a friendly and welcoming community for all. You can support us by one, following our code of conduct so that our members can feel welcomed and come back again. We also have a Discord community chat where you can ask and answer questions, share events, jobs, and other relevant material. You can support us by donating to our nonprofit. We are on Open Collective as the Umbrella. We are also on Benevity, which is a company matched enable platform where if you donate, for example, a hundred dollars, your company matches the same donation. We also have a YouTube channel. So our YouTube channel is the Umbrella. Uh, you can find interesting libraries on our YouTube channel like Career Advice, data visualization, contributing to open source, uh, PyMC, scikit-learn, and NumPy. We also have a monthly newsletter. We are on Substack, uh, so you can find us on Substack at the Umbrella. We release a newsletter every once a month, so we won't spam you. You'll just get one uh, newsletter per month. We also have resources on our website. Our website is datambrella.org. There you can find a list of conferences, uh, guidelines on inclusive language, burnout, AI ethics, and other uh, material related to tech. We are on all social media platforms as Datambrella. Uh, you can also find uh, us on, on GitHub. We also have a job board on our website and working on an event board, which we have made open source. So if it's something that can interest you, you can look at that as well. You can also join our meetup group. Uh, we have two meetup groups, one the Umbrella and the other the Umbrella Africa, and we usually post all upcoming events there. Uh, this webinar has a live captioning. So if you need to use the live captioning, at the right of your screen, there is a button labeled CC. You can use that uh, to get the live captioning. Uh, we have a call for volunteers. Uh, if you're interested in helping us get timestamps, which helps the video uh, get to more viewers and users who want a certain type of material, you can do that. We have a, we have GitHub issues on on transcripts. For example, if you're a fan of Rust, once we upload this video, uh, you can go and add timestamps to it. Uh, you can also add timestamps depending on your time. If the video is too long, you can add. Uh, timestamps to half of it, and the rest can be done with uh, someone else. So don't feel the pressure to like add timestamps to the whole video if you don't have enough time. Uh, we have upcoming events. So this month we have another event on uh, contributing to RVs and open source. And in December, which will be our last event of the year, will be Data Science Career Tips on December 6th. Uh, all these events can be found on Meetup. Uh, today, we are going to talk about introduction to Rust programming, and our speaker is Bruno Rocha, who is a software engineer who works, uh, who works at uh, Red Hat. Uh, he's a member of the Python Software Foundation, and he has been 
RS enthusiast for the past five years. You can find him on GitHub, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Uh, this handout, uh, these um, slides are in the handout section. So if you want to get links to his social media platforms, you can find them there. Uh, so feel free to also tweet about this event. And with that, I'll now hand over the microphone and the video to uh, Bruno. And if you have questions during the talk, you don't have to wait till the end of the talk to ask your questions. Just leave them in the chat or the question and answer session, and we will get to them as Bruno continues. So, Bruno. Hi, thank you, Barry, and uh, thank you all, everyone, for coming. So yeah, my goal today is to give like a very brief introduction to the Rust programming language. And yeah, so we go over some basics of the Rust language and then we will try to create a very small application for you to understand the uh, features and differences that Rust comes uh, that are uh, really like uh, very different from other languages. So yeah. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen one second, and I hope you all can see my screen. And I created this repository. It, there is no code here. It's just a markdown file. And here you can find some instructions on how to get Rust installed on your computer. So Rust is a compiled language. So once we write our source code, we need to compile to generate the binary and you need an environment where you can uh, run the Rust compiler. Uh, so if you can, the best way to do is to install Rust. There is a tool called RustApp. Uh, RustApp is the like official installer for Rust language. And you just go to the RustApp.rs and there are instructions here to, uh, if you are on a Unix-based system, you can copy this and install, it's very safe to run because it runs on your user, not admin uh, level, and it's gonna be installing all the needed libraries and, and, and tooling for uh, Rust. The tooling that in, is installed with this uh, Rust installer is what we call ToChain. So ToChain is our like toolbox for working and, and, and managing projects in, in Rust. And if you are using uh, an operational system, uh, like if you are using Windows, you can go to other installation options and here you can find uh, the ways to install it on, on Windows. Uh, but if you are just starting with Rust, I think you can run the environment completely online in your browser. Don't need to uh, install at this point. So I'm gonna show you some ways you can do it. Uh, on the repository, I pasted uh, a link to a platform called Gitpod. I've uh, been using Gitpod for doing this kind of presentations and it works very well. There is a free account that you can use for some hours and you can experiment on languages and, and platforms. So uh, once you log in in Gitpod and create your account with your GitHub or any other uh, authentication they provide, you can click this link Gitpod.io and, and the path to the repository, which is going to be an empty repository, but they just need like a base repository to get started. And then you can have like a workspace created for you. I'm going to show you the uh, workspace. It takes a little bit of time uh, the first time to uh, start it because it's based on, on containers. But the nice part is that it runs entirely in your browser. and. Uh, Gitpod runs um, in Linux, so you have access to a uh, whole Linux terminal here where we are going to be running uh, the Rust uh, compiler and all the Rust tooling. And you have also in your browser access to an editor, which is very similar to the Visual Studio Code. So you you can really use it and save this environment for later. Uh, I think they keep it for two weeks if you don't change it. So I really recommend if you want to try Rust or any other language, Gitpod is a very nice thing to use. Uh, besides Gitpod, there is another platform called Replit. Uh, Replit supports many languages. One of them is Rust. It's very similar. You log in on replit.com with your GitHub or other account, 
And then you have an ID, like an editor to put all your code and you have access to a shell where you can run Rust. They run a very like uh, older, outdated version of Rust, but that's not a problem. Uh, most of the things are included on this version and you can uh, use it. And lastly, if you just need to like evaluate simple Rust scripts, you can go to the Rust Playground, which is an official tool. It's on the play.rustlang.org. It's uh, develop, uh, maintained by the Rust core developers. And here you can paste Rust snippets and run it. It's going to be compiled and, and executed through your browser. No need to install anything. So those are the options you have to uh, be running and, and doing your first program with Rust. And yeah, the about the material. Uh, I have a program that I'm going to be following here. So you find here on this repository the topics I want to cover. Uh, I hope I have time to cover everything to the end. But after this, if you are interested in learning more in depth about Rust, I recommend the official Rust book. It is on doc.rustlink.org uh, slash book. And this is a very complete like manual. It's not like a normal documentation. It's really a book written by the Rust core developers. It's free uh, and available um, for you to consult and access. And this is for sure the best uh, reference we have to learn and use Rust language. Yeah, so yeah, with that, uh, let's get started with the program. So um, you need to have Rust install it, and you need to have a dev environment where you can uh, execute Rust C uh, and other toolings and edit your uh, Rust code. In my case, I'll be using just a terminal. So I have a terminal here, um, and I split this terminal into uh, screens. So here I'm going to be editing my code, and here I'm going to be compiling and running. Um, you can use any code editor or IDE that you like with Rust. Uh, some of those then are uh, coming with better support for Rust. Uh, I think the most recommended IDE is VS Code. Uh, VS Code has support to Rust Analyzer, which is, is a very cool backend for um, helping you to use Rust and autocomplete and all those features. Uh, you find also Rust support on NeoVim, on Emacs, IntelliJ. Uh, IDEs also comes with Rust support. There are some Rust-based uh, uh, editors like Helix and Lapsy. And then, yeah, you can really use any of them. I have a personal opinion. Uh, it's very personal that uh, I don't like to be like very used to the platform I'm running like to the editor. So I use the bare minimum. Uh, so in the past, I use it just a bare Vim or Nano uh, to edit my codes. But recently, I found another code editor called Micro. So this is what I use today to edit my codes. Uh, sometimes I use VS Code when the project is very larger. Uh, but I think Micro is a terminal editor that can support the basic. It doesn't have all the features we usually have in other uh, environments, like it doesn't have autocomplete and those things. But especially if you are learning, I recommend you to use something very simple that will force you to go to the documentation and really dig into things if you have time uh, for that. So, uh, well, you can use anything you want to code in Rust. I'm going to use Micro. It's just a terminal-based uh, text editor. And let's start talking about uh, Rust. So Rust is a compiled language. And you have the source code in a file with the .rs um, extension. Um, and then the programs in Rust can be libraries or binaries. But binaries are the most common we usually write. Uh, especially if you are starting for a beginning, you're going to be writing a lot of binary applications, which are like applications to run directly in a shell or another environment. Um, and all the Rust programs has an entry point. This entry point is the function called main. So in the Rust source code, we create this main function. 
And when we run this binary, that's the function that will be invoked and everything inside it will be executed. Uh, in Rust, you, you can print like to the terminal. Instead of a function, we use a macro. Uh, I can talk later about the difference about function and macro, but on a higher level, this works just like a function, uh, except that it has uh, exclamation uh, mark uh, on its name. Uh, you pass here arguments just like a print function. It's going to print line, which is the text I pass to it, plus a line break. Uh, and macros also are some compiler uh, specific feature. It's going to be like evaluated and, and uh, expanded before the compilation. So behind the macro, Rust is doing lots of boilerplate for us. So uh, usually we use macro when we need to to have shortcuts to the real code. So to print to the standard output, instead of importing all the libraries needed for doing it, we just use uh, printLN. And like we do the very traditional Hello World program, you need to do this in every language you get started. So let's do it with Rust. So this is the most basic Rust program. And also you have this written in your source code. You need to go to like another terminal, like I have here on, on my right side, and then you need to run Rust C. So I'll run Rust C dash dash version. You can see I'm running the latest release of Rust 1.65. Uh, it it's gonna work with whatever version you have. There is no specific new feature that I'm gonna be using here uh, today. And Rust C is a compiler, so it's gonna take as input the file uh, where you are. Uh, Rust source code is, and once you compile it, it generates a binary with the na same name of your uh, source code. So in this case, it's generated this hello uh, binary. So as it's a binary, I can just run it and it's going to print hello to the screen. So uh, this is one of the nice things about Rust is that Rust doesn't need a runtime. So you write your programs in a source code, you compile it, and you get the binary compiled by uh, targeting the platform where you compiled. So in my case, I am on Linux, 6.4 uh, uh, bit. So if I move this file to another system in the same architecture, I would just run it without the need to install Rust there, without the need to create environments there. It's like really compiling, targeting the architecture. And of course, you can... Um, do cross compilation if you want to like tar target this program to more than one architecture or like operational system. Uh, you can do this in, in in another ways, and this is the very basic uh, program you can you can do. So yeah, this is what we usually do for small programs like small scripts like this. And if you are working working in a project, you start working in a web project, an API or something really larger, you are not going to uh, manage multiple standalone files by your own. So Rust comes with some other tooling to help you to manage projects and dependencies. So we're going to exit the here and we're going to look to the cargo. So cargo is another command that is installed when you install Rust uh, using Rust app or running online, everything is going to be installed there. Uh, Cargo is a tool that will provide uh, features to manage your project, to start new projects, uh, and to run administrative commands on your projects. And also, Cargo supports plugins. So you see, I have lots of Cargo dash things here. It's all like components or plugins that I can install. Uh, with my cargo system, and then I can run it on, on, on my source code. So when I'm running cargo, I can create a new project. So I go, I'm going to create a project called Hello World here. Uh, cargo new Hello World will create a binary application in Rust. Uh, the difference now is that this binary application is no more a standalone file. It's now a project. So Rust is going to be creating a folder called Hello World. So let me remove the Hello RS and the Hello from here. We have just the project right now. Then I'm going to CD to the project. And inside here, you see that 
I have a file called cargo.toml. So whenever you are in a folder and in this folder you have a cargo.toml, we say we are in a Rust workspace. So in the Rust workspace, we can run cargo tools to manage our project. And the basic structure for Rust project is this, a folder with a cargo toml and SRC folder. So these are the mandatory uh, components. And then other components will depend on which kind of application you are developing. Uh, for this case, we are developing a binary application to run in the terminal, just like I did here with this hello. Um, but you can start a library, you can start a WebAssembly application. So there are ways to uh, have different components, but those are the basics. So let's take a look on the cargo Tomil file. It's a configuration uh, file using the Tomil format, uh, which is currently very common in many other technologies and languages. It's going to be holding the package information for your program. So my program, uh, my project is called Hello World. There's the version, there is the edition, and I can put more metadata here, like author, email, website, all those things we do for uh, distributing our application and, and maintaining it. And the most important part is the section where we have dependencies. So once we want to reuse code written by someone else. We're going to be putting the list of dependencies and versions here on this file. And then inside the SRC folder, we have a main.rs file. Uh, also, when you are in a Rust workspace, it's mandatory that you have inside your SRC folder for the binary, a file called main. And main, main is going to be the entry point. So the same way we did before, but now we are in a more like folder structure. And you see we have the uh, hello world here. Rust automatically put that here uh, for us. And now if I go to my other terminal, I can enter on the hello world and I can use cargo. So uh, what can I do with cargo? I can check if there are some problems with the code. I run cargo check. If my code is like not very well formatted like this, I can run cargo FMT and cargo will be formatting for me and uh, putting all the styling changes. And I can use cargo run to compile and execute. And then I'm going to see hello world here. So cargo is the tool we use every time when we are developing and, and programming in Rust. So usually you write your source code in one or multiple files, and then you go and run cargo. Uh, as I said, there are plugins we can use. One of them is called Cargo Watch. So you can do Cargo Watch X run, and it's going to be watching for changes in my source code. And whenever I save it, it compiles and runs automatically for me. Uh, that's nice to have when you are doing lots of changes and once, like, for example, tests to be running automatically or up web applications to be reloaded. Um, so all this tooling is going to be uh, managed through Cargo. Um, to have this, I needed to install the Cargo Watch tool. Uh, but in the Cargo web page, you can find all the Cargo plugins that you have. Today, we have lots of things we can do with Cargo. But the basic things are creating a new project and managing uh, our dependencies and building or running your program. So in this case, Cargo Run is what we are doing the most. And the Rust compiler has uh, is, is very famous because it um, it tries to give you rich information when you have errors in your code. So that's why usually you want to keep both terminals open. So usually you have your editor; it can be like this or VS Code, but also you want to have the terminal open to watch for compiler errors and warnings because we're gonna learn. And, and have a lot of feedback from the from the compiler. So that's why my workspace usually is something like this. Yeah. Yeah, so this is like the very first introduction. How do you do hello world in Rust? A function main inside a main file, uh, main RS, and then you can do print ln and print hello world. 
So now let's talk about variables. Yeah, so any program that is not a Hello World program, we're going to need to acquire different kinds of resources. And then we put this in the variables, uh, values in memory, pointers to files in the file system, connection to databases. And for doing that, we need to uh, have variables. So I'm going to clean up everything on this file. And it's an empty file. Let's see how Rust works for var variable definition and initialization. Uh, the keyword to define a variable in Rust is let, so it's a statement in a keyword. Uh, after let, we give a name to our variable. So in my case, I would do something very simple like x. And then I do an assignment expression. So x equals, I'll put a number here, x equals 5. And this is um, a variable definition. I need to end all the lines with the semicolon. Uh, not all the lines. There are some lines which we don't want semicolon, but most of them we want. I uh, will show when we don't want later. And you will expect that this works because this is how it works on many other programming languages. You just like if you are in Python or Ruby or any other dynamic language, you just open your file and then you put your variable definitions there. So if I save here, I'm going to have an error. My editor is already showing the error here, but I will run in cargo so you can see the better uh, the message in a better um, size. So you see that uh, when I try to compile this simple code, which I'm just defining a variable, the compiler is telling me that something is wrong. So compiler is saying that expected an item and found a keyword on that place. And the compiler will try to teach us how to do that. So consider using const or static instead of let for global variables. Uh, and usually, if you are declaring a variable at this level of the file, you want to use const or static. I will talk about those in a minute. Uh, but this already teaching us something about Rust that has something to do with how Rust manages memory and uh, about the Rust memory safety. So the let keyword is trying to allocate memory. Uh, it's trying to point to a value in the memory. And we cannot do this in the global scope of our program. So Rust enforces us to do variable assignment inside functions. So we need to create a function and do this inside a function. Can be the main function, as we did here, or any other function, but variables must exist inside a function. And if I do this right now, it's going to work. I don't have errors. Uh, I'm going to have warnings. I will talk about warning uh, in a second. Uh, but let's, let's understand why Rust does this, why we cannot assign variables outside of the scope of the function. Um, there are languages that has manual memory management. So if you do, if you're programming C or C++, usually you create a variable and then at some point you need to call delete X so you can free that memory you allocated and you can call, you can do a system call directly. You can have a keyword like delete. So it depends based on, on the language. Uh, but there is this the need to clean the memory because if you don't clean the memory, you're going to have memory leaks. So uh, it's very important to clean. Um, there are languages like dynamic languages or Java or Python or Ruby uh, and so on that has another uh, approach, which are, is called garbage collector. Uh, the garbage collector will, from time to time, put a new procedure in your program. And from time to time, let's say every 30 seconds, it depends on the runtime, but uh, it's going to run a procedure that will look to the memory and see if there are things to be cleaned there, uh, variables, values that are not being used, that has no reference, is going to be cleaned for you. Uh, and that works really well. But Rust doesn't have a garbage collector. So in Rust, you don't clean your memory manually and also you don't have a garbage collector to clean the memory for you uh, and that's because 
a garbage collector puts an overhead. So every like 30 seconds, you have another thing running that's not part of your code. If you have a garbage collector, for example, like you have in Go, uh, and if you have to manage memory manually, you are open to uh, uncertainty because you can like forget or you can like try to clean up twice and have a, a, a double free error. And then Rust tries to avoid this by adopting a pattern called RAII, which stands for Resource Acquisition is Initialization. This doesn't say a lot, but this is something that started with C++ and is a common part, pattern on C++ uh, programs. And what Rust, Rust does, Rust extends our AII with, with more components that we're going to see in a minute. Uh, but the basic our AII is here intrinsic, embedded in the language. So uh, to give a very simplified uh, explanation on it, it says that um, whenever I acquire a value in the memory, so it, it in Rust, we usually use this word acquire uh, instead of like variable definition. You're going to see variable definition in some like books, uh, but we try to use own or acquire uh, because it's, uh, it's what happens in, in this model. So in this case, we say that X is acquiring five. So we are putting five in some place in the memory and X is becoming the owner of it. It's acquiring it. So here is where lifetime of X starts. So um, at some point, Rust needs to know where lifetime of X is going to end. So Rust can clean the memory for you. And then Rust is going to use the context for doing it. So that's the reason we need to have a function to define variables there. Because when the function goes out of scope, we know that lifetime for X ends. And if I have multiple variables here, let's say I have a Y equals nine, both lifetimes will end here. So um, for this example, this is not too much because we have two simple primitive variables, but we, when we are talking about more complex data structures, this makes more sense. Uh, but the compiler will do this management for us. I don't need to say that lifetime starts here unless I want. And I don't need to say to Rust that the lifetime ends here. Rust will do this automatically. So when the code reach this point, uh, the compiler will try to clean up everything uh, from the memory part where it's allocated. Uh, if it's on the stack, it's going to be easier because it's just like popping the last element from the memory stack memory. If it's on the heap, uh, which more dynamic objects going to be stored, it, there will be another uh, procedure there. I will try to show you how it works. Uh, but that's why Rust needs this and enforce this. So if you tried Rust and, and got that problem of not being able to do a variable definition, that's the reason. And it has something to do with memory management. And I can say that most of the things you're going to see and suffer when you start uh, trying Rust is related to memory safe. Uh, so Rust will try to enforce us to do the safe it on, on the memory level. So uh, we need to take a very closer look to what the terminal is telling us and, and try to learn, learn from the compiler. So in this case, I will do cargo run again here. And you see that I don't have errors anymore. Uh, in this case, I have a warning. So these yellow messages here are telling me like tips on how to improve my code, on how to make my code better looking, and also how to make my code better like on performance. And in this case, it's very simple. It's telling me that I assigned a variable X, like I did a memory allocation, but it's an unnecessary memory allocation. So I don't need it because I'm not using it anywhere in the code. And sometimes it happens, especially if your code is too large uh, and you are like on, uh, you, you scroll a lot your, your source code and you forgot some variable on the top. So the compiler will try to help you understand where you have variables that you don't need. So 
Another interesting thing of the Rust compiler on this point is that it gives you exactly the instruction you need to follow. So in this case, if you really want an unnecessary memory allocation, you need to put an underscore before it. So every time you see an underscore, it means that we are telling the compiler to just ignore and don't give warnings about that value. We don't want to use it and how it compiles without errors. So yeah, so you see that Rust is different uh, from what we expect on programming languages. And there is a very good reason for it, which is avoiding the most common problems we usually see, especially on the lower level systems programming, when we have dangling pointers, new exceptions, and that, those kinds of errors. Uh, it's something that Rust will always try to uh, make us like free of those problems. And we don't have to pay the cost, like we need to learn. The The learning curve will be like a very steep, but uh, you see that the code is not too much. It's just like a, a variable assignment. And we have all those guards around it because um, it's how the, the language works. So yeah, with that, I think we can go to the next topic, uh, which is the type inference. Um, uh, let me just do a quick check here to see if everything is okay with my audio and things. Yeah, I hope so, <laughs> because I'm not looking to the uh, presenter room, but I think everything is okay. Let me continue. Um, <clears throat> typing. Rust is a static typed language. So uh, you see that we did this like x equals 5, and we haven't specify the type for it, and it just works. There is no compilation error. We can run the program, uh, but Rust is stat statically typed. How it works? Uh, the compiler needs to know the type of the variables before it can compile. Uh, so we're going to be doing inference. So by the context or by the literals, it's going to be trying to parse the value. So in this case, as this looks like an integer, the compiler will be doing the inference to an integer and we'll put the type here for us, but we can do this explicitly if we want. So in this case, it's gonna be in Y32, uh, which is one of the uh, types we have to represent integer numbers in Rust. We have lots of others, but this is the most common and also, this is the default that the compiler we use whenever we don't spe specify. Uh, in this case, we are recommended to not specify because it's very like uh, unnecessary. The compiler will do the inference for us, and we just we need to care about typing everything only when the context is missing. So, if the compiler gives us an error saying that compiler is not able to infer the type, then we go and we put the type. Uh, in, uh, otherwise, we just let the compiler do the work for us and, and try to not do it. So yeah, but this is how it looks syntactically. We can put the name of the variable, uh, column, and then the name of the type. And there is lots of names that for the building types, and we can also create uh, the types by our own. So, in this case, I will do like I8 here. I will explain in a minute, uh, show a table for you on all the available types. Um, so I have um, showed you the print statement, uh, which is a macro called print ln. So I'll do the same thing here, print ln, and then we're going to print this number. So print ln macro can print strings as we did before. Uh, but also it can do string interpolation. So we can do variable substitution like this and then pass X here as an argument. And then when compiling, it's going to run and show the number five here on my terminal. You see, there is lots of messages here on cargo, but the output is the latest one here, five. Um, recently, Rust added template substitution so we can do variable lookup directly here. So instead of doing this and passing as an argument, I can also do put text inside here on the placeholder and also it works. Not for all the cases, but for basic cases like this, it also works. So 
this is a very basic um, thing we usually want to do in our uh, code, um, and how this is how we do. Um, when we are coding and we want to print something on the terminal just for the bugging purposes, we don't use println. So there is another macro called dbg, which stands for debug. So we can use this one. Uh, and dbg uh, will not have this templating thing. So you just put the variable there. And then when you run, you're going to see uh, more information, like you see the path for the file, the line where it is, and x equals 5. So it's better for when you just want to print something to, to the bug and, and yeah. So that's the way we usually print. Uh, let me go to the next topic. Um, and I, I, I'll take a look with, on the QA, Q &A and a and questions later. I will just try to go in uh, and keep going with the program here because I have lots of topics and I want to create a very small terminal based program so we can have something working at the end of this uh, webinar. So I'll, if, if I'm going too fast or too slow, just let me know. Okay. Yeah. So um, next thing is, uh, let me put another example here. So I'll remove this typing for now and I'll print this here on the terminal. And I'll just print here the variable x the same way I did before, cargo run, and then I have five here on my terminal. Let me make it this one bigger. Okay, so I have five here. So one thing that is very common to do in other languages is to mutate data. So you expect that when you go here to this code and you do like, for example, x equals x times two, so let's double x, and print x again, you will naturally expect that Rust will print here 5, and then an x print, it's going to be doubling and printing uh, 10. So I'll try to run. Uh, first, I need to save. Um, and then I'll try to run. And you're going to see that Rust doesn't allow us to do that. So this is one of the things that people uh, like got frustrated when doing Rust, because the most basic program is difficult to get running because of the memory safe it, uh, features. So it's not very straightforward to just like start a number and then double it and then printing it again. And then you see this kind of message on the compiler. But there is a reason for that. That's a very good reason. And if you read the compiler message, you'll be uh, knowing uh, exactly what you need to do because the compiler will try to teach you how to fix your code. And actually, there is a plugin called Cargo Fix that if you want to run Cargo Fix, Cargo will fix your code automatically in some case for you. So in this case, uh, it's saying that we cannot assign twice to immutable variable, right? So by default, every variable in Rust is immutable. Once you start it, you cannot change it. And this is for safety. This is, in the most cases, what you want. Like you want to have immutability and turn on mutability on the places where you control. And the compiler is telling us here that uh, exactly what we need to do. So consider making this binding mutable. And then there is a tip here. Let me make this bigger. Uh, it shows here the hint what we have to do. So instead of declaring x, we need to declare x as a mutable variable. So every time you want to have something that you can change, you need to manually turn this into a mutable variable. So how we do this? Just by putting the mute keyword um, here. So in this case, I'm going to do this. And then I'll run. And now you can see that I have the expected result, 5 and 10, right? So yeah, this is uh, something you need to wonder uh, to know from the beginning, because you need to like start thinking about where you are going to declare your variables. 
uh, and if you need mutability, you need to think of that from the beginning or go with the compiler hints and messages to understand where you need it. Uh, but now you're going to see that uh, I have on my editor uh, this uh, error here. It's not showing on the terminal because it's a different tool. Like I said, uh, editors have extra tooling to work with uh, Rust. If you are using Visual Studio Code, you're going to see more hints. In this case, my editor is saying that I'm trying to do uh, implementation of a sign operation. It's not like blocking my code to work, right? Uh, but it's not very idiomatic. It's not something we usually like to have in our code, like x equal x plus 2. So in this case, I can run Cargo Clippy, which is a tool to help with code styling and, and improvement. And Cargo Clip will tell us what we are doing. So in the line 6, I'm trying to do manual implementation of a sign operation. If you look to this in the Clippy documentation, you're going to see that instead of doing this, I can do something very better, which is this. So I can use the assign keyword to do like x times 2, and then I can run and everything works and I don't have that anymore. And well, so those little things that can improve or make the styling of my code better is something that you don't need like to memorize everything from the beginning. You can just use that tooling like Cargo, Cargo Clip, uh, and the compiler messages that will start giving you hints. So my recommendation is always read those messages. Try to not ignore warnings and, and, and tips that uh, Cargo Tools will give you. Uh, you can learn a lot uh, from that, right? So yeah, this is um, how you turn your variables mutable. So let's now go to another topic, which is the strong typing. So Rust is statically typing. So you the compiler need to know the types, in this case, x is an integer because it's inferred as an integer. And Rust needs to have mutability explicitly set. If you don't have mutability, you can't change your variable uh, later. Uh, and when you are doing this kind of mutation, so if I want like to do like x equals 9 here and try to run, it's going to work. So I have 5, and then after I have 9. But if I want to try to change x to something like data umbrella, which is a different data type, I'm going to have a problem. Like So if I try to run it, it's going to say that uh, I have a mismatch types. So this is a strong typing because Rust is not trying to do coercion of the variables. Even if I have a 5 here or something that looks like a number, like let's say 6, I'm going to still have the same error because when Rust did the inference of this type, it's going to be inferring this as a reference to a string, not a number. And then you cannot have like a variable defined as an integer, change it to a value that is uh, a string or any other. So the typing is really strong. You are not able to do this kind of mutation. When you do mutation, you need to ensure you are mutating to the same data type. Again, this is because of the memory. So when we first defined this x, all the value are being reserved for an integer. So if I try to like coerce and change it to another type, it's going to be really different. Maybe it doesn't fit in the same space in the memory. So uh, you can do this. But you can do another thing, which is some kind of workaround with, if you really want to do like this. So let's say I want to change x here to data umbrella, right? I really need this in my program, and I'm getting this compiler error. How do I do? I can do variable shadowing, which is different than mutation. So when I assign an x here to the value 5, it's pointing to the specific memory place where 5 is. If I try to change, it's going to be changing that specific place in the memory. 
But if I use let keyword again, what I'm doing is I'm assigning X again. So this X is completely new from the scratch. And this is going to replace the other X I have in memory. And from now I can run without errors. You're going to see that it was five in the beginning and later it was data umbrella and my code works. Um, you see, I have a uh, warning on this terminal on the right and the warning is trying to get my code better, teaching me how to improve it. And it's saying that now that I'm not mutating X anymore, I'm replacing it with a new variable. I don't need it to be mute, mutate, uh, mutable. So my code is clean, no compiler errors, and I can run. So you see that my editor can show those messages for me. I don't usually need to go to the uh, directly to the terminal to see if I put mute here and save, I'm going to have the feedback directly on the editor. Uh, but I, I really like when I'm doing this kind of uh, presentation to run in the terminal. So the message is, is more like clear, right? So variable shadowing is, um, is something that is related to how memory is also uh, laid out in, in, in Rust. And we can do variable shadowing the way I did here, but we can also do variable shadowing in separate scopes. So I can, for example, start a new scope here just using the curly brackets. And then um, Rust will define this x equals 5 here. And then we'll define, we start a new scope. This new scope will get like a new level on the memory stack where I can do shadowing. This x will be pushed to this memory and I can have x equals data umbrella only inside this scope. So here I'm going to print data umbrella. And then when I get here, x from inside is out of scope. And then when I try to use x here, what I'm actually using is the x from the outside, right? So this is uh, interesting because this inner scopes can give us like more freedom to manipulate data in the middle. Uh, we can do this with mutable variables also. And uh, this inner scope can be another function, can be a closure, uh, but it's very useful for this kind of thing. So let me run just for you to see what does it mean. Uh, I'll run a with cargo run. You see uh, X is defined as five. Then inside this scope, it's redefined as a string. I print it, but then when I try to print again out of the scope, it's still five I got from uh, outside, right? So uh, what is also interesting is that this is a, an expression. So I can assign this. If I have like a result being returned from here, I can do like, for example, let uh, thing equal and what is calculated inside this inner scope can be uh, binded to this new variable, but I'm not going to show this right now because I want to move on with the next thing. I don't know if I still have time, but I think I have. So let's go. You <laughs> uh, still have time. Okay, thank you. Um, well, so in this case, we are talking about variables. And uh, when I started, I told you that we cannot use let here. Like I can do, I can do like let y equals ten here. I'm gonna have an error. Expected item found keyword. This place is where we call the global scope, right? And this place is where we call the local scope of the function. So let can be used only on function local scope. But there are times when you need global variables where you can use across all your functions. Um, and for doing that, we can use the const. So const works just like let, but it's going to be defining a variable that has a lifetime, which is the entire program. Uh, and there are some specific things about constants. One of them is that it should be written in uppercase. Uh, if you don't do it in uppercase, it will work. No problem, but there is a convention. Just like in Python, uh, you need to write constants in uppercase. So, for example, I will write seconds in 
uh, minute. So this is a good example where you need a constant instead of variable because you don't have uh, you have a specific fix uh, set of minute uh, seconds in a minute. Also, when you are doing constants, Rust cannot infer the type, so you need to specify the type. In this case, I'm gonna use u16, which is an integer of 16 bytes without the sign uh, unsigned. And I'll say that I have 60 uh, seconds in a minute, right? So uh, constants in Rust are, are very performatic because it's not written in the memory, it's written in the binary itself. So Rust does a thing called inlining. So when it's compiled, uh, the constant is inlined with the code. That means that if I want to go here and say, uh, I have five minutes and now I want to know a uh, total of minutes of seconds I have in five minutes, just for a very simple example. I can do minutes times uh, the constant and then this operation here will be evaluated at the runtime, right? Uh, but this constant here will be inlined by the compiler. Compiler will not need to do memory lookup. We not need to do system calls to go to the memory or any other place. During the compilation, compiler will just replace this with the 16 we, uh, 60 we have above. So constants are really an abstraction, a costless abstraction we have. And instead of hard coding this number all the time in our code, uh, you just use this uh, alias, uh, but at the end, it's the same as we are typing hard-coded there, right? Uh, so in this case, I can print here total, and I can do uh, using this, like there is total seconds in uh, minutes, minutes. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> Uh, minutes, right? So very simple. Let me run it. And we're gonna see there is uh, 300 seconds in five minutes. Yeah, so yeah, so I will not talk now about the other kind. There is another kind of variable in Rust, but I will not have a const context right now to show you the static variables. But for the basic programs, we're gonna use like constants or uh, variables, so const and let are the ways we do. And another detail about constants is that it's an uppercase. Uh, we call it screaming snake case because it's uppercase and separated with underline. Uh, you need to define the type here. It doesn't have inference and you cannot define it twice. If you try to define it twice, you're gonna have an error. So the name seconds is defined multiple times. So uh, it's just a single place you can define and it cannot never be mutable. So constant is really constant, uh, which is very different from the, the, the variable, right? Um, yeah, so with that, we go to the next topic. Yeah. So the next topic, I will, I'll clean up this. And let's talk about the types we have in Rust. Um, everything in Rust is based on the type system. So the weight data is put in the memory, depends on the type system. So depending on which type you choose to use, it's going to be placed on a different space in the memory. Uh, and uh, sometimes you need to think about it, like you have more memory awareness when you are coding to decide if you need like an integer or any other kind of, of typing because of this. Uh, but the basics are very common and similar to other languages, right? Uh, so um, we have uh, integers like we did here. So I'll do let x equals five. If I don't pass the type here, Rust will infer for me this as an i32. So i32 is integer of 32 bytes. This integer is signed, so I can have the minus or plus signal on the number. And 
I have all the integers starting from 8. So I have I8, I16, I32, I64, until I128. Uh, so if I want to use unsigned, I can start with U. So I have U8 for unsigned 8 bits, unsigned 16, and so on. So why is this why this matters uh, for us when we are doing uh, creating an integer? Most of the times you can let the compiler decide for you which integer you need. And if you have a error message, then you go and try to fix. Uh, but if you know uh, what you're going to do with this number, like which kind of operations you're gonna need to like calculate which kind of integer you need. Or if you want to save memory, let's say this is by default I32. So it's uh, going to 32 bits in the memory just to store a 5. And I can put this 5 in I8. So if I need this kind of tuning, I can specify by my own uh, the type I want to use. And on the Rust book that I showed before, there is this data types um, menu here. Um, and here you see in this table all the integer types. So this is the size, this is the nominal type, um, and you can go, you can choose them. And this really depends on how much numbers you want to store. So for example, if you go to I8, which is a signed uh, integer of 8 bits, you can store from minus 128, to 127. If you go to U8, which is unsigned, you can go from 0 to 255. So basically, there's this formula on the base 2 to get which range of numbers you can uh, store. But again, this is something you're going to concern only if you really need, and compiler will uh, show you if you need this. Uh, so. In many cases, you can just go with the defaults, right? And talking about numbers, if you have a very like large number, you can like for example do this five thousand, or you can use underlines whatever you want to have a syntax separator. It's like just you are. Oh, in this case, you see that I started this with a very bigger number but it's out of range for an I32. So the compiler is telling me that I'm gonna have an overflow. So if I really want this big number, I need to restore this in I64. So uh, in this case, I'm not sure if it's gonna fit, but in this case it fits in I64. So sometimes you need this kind of tuning related to the memory usage. So this is for integers. There are There is a lot of other kinds of integers like binary, literals, you have uh, hexadecimal, octals, and so on. But let's keep it simple for now. Um, this is an integer that's going to be an I32. Um, on the basic primitive data types, you have also floats. So I create here a float, which is going to be 4.3. So every time we use dot in our literal, Rust will be inferring as a float. By default, it's an F64 because F64 has double precision. So even if your computer is 32 bits, F64 is going to be the, the type uh, for floats. But if you really need, you can specify the other one, which is F32. But it's hair that it, it's not very common that you need to do that. Uh, so this is going to be an F64. You can do almost all the operations you do with integers. Uh, we have booleans, so let me find another letter here, Z. Uh, booleans in Rust, the nominal type is bool, so you can specify, or you let compiler uh, infer because it's very simple. You can store just true, uh, it's all lowercase, or false, all lowercase. So this is only the two values, and again, this is we inferred as a boolean. And there is another type in Rust that most dynamic higher level languages doesn't have, which is the character. So I'll create a W here. And on the single quote, I'll put a letter A 
So this is what we call a car or char. I don't really know exactly the right pronunciation, if it's car or char. Maybe uh, the, both pronunciations are right, but it's a single character. Uh, this is a code point for the UTF-8 um, table. So any Unicode four bytes will be allowed you to put here. So about the, the, the character, what you need to really know is that you always use single code for doing the, the chars. And you can't use like double quotes here because if you use double quotes, it's gonna be a different type. And you put only a single character there and this character there should be a code point on the Unicode table. That means you can have emojis uh, inside here. So you can have something like this as long as the emoji is at least uh, at maximum four bytes in the Unicode uh, table. So this example works. It's a very common uh, emoji. I don't have compiler efforts. I have warnings because I'm not using the variables, but yeah, I can turn the warnings off if I want, but I don't recommend, especially if you're learning. So these are the primitive types of Rust. Uh, you see that they are simple and you don't need to, from the start, care a lot about the typing specifically. Uh, but it's interesting when you are coding Rust for better performance uh, that you go to the table on the on the documentation and and start reading on exactly which types you need to use for uh, the program you are creating, right? Uh, so these primitive types are the scalar ones, which means they hold only a single value, and we have of course the primitives for uh, storing the compound types. So for example, if I want to uh, have a, uh, a variable, uh, I'll call this tup, and I want to hold number one, number two dot two, I want to hold here a true and also a letter. So I can create this and Rust will infer this as a tuple. Uh, tuple is not a type in Rust. I will, I will explain it right now. So let me remove this here to make it clear. So a tuple is the most common way to group more than one scalar type together. And there is no type called tuple in Rust. What Rust does is creating a type for you based on the structure. So in this case, if I want to declare the typing here, I'll need to do this. Like I have a tuple with I32, with F64, with Boolean, and with car. So this thing is the type. You see, there is no name for it. It's a tuple with this specific data inside it. And that's how I specify in function arguments and function returns and structs and other places you need to specify uh, your tuples because tuples are fixed in size. So once I declare it with four values, I cannot grow it. It's immutable in the size. Uh, and yeah, it can hold different types. So I can have a tuple with all integers, but I can mix multiple types together. And there are interesting things about tuples that, and that's why it's like maybe the most used type in Rust. Uh, let, let me create a very simple tuple here. I'll create a tuple with three numbers just to make it easier as an example. And I'll put here one, two, and three. So this is a tuple. Uh, once you have a tuple created, you can access the elements of the tuple. So let me do this with println. And here I need to use the variable interpolation. And for example, if I want to access the number two, I need to access by the index. So starts on zero, zero, one. So tuple uses the dot notation. So I'll do tup dot one, and then I can print uh, the number two in my terminal, right? So this is a little bit different because here we don't use the, uh, the square brackets. We use dot and pass the index uh, as it was like a, a, an attribute. Uh, and this is how we differentiate tuples from arrays. So that's very important to have this in the syntax. So you know that that 
value is a tuple instead of an array that I will show in a minute. And uh, also you can destructure the tuple values uh, in a, an assignment because everything in Rust is a pattern matching. So every time you use let, what comes in the left side is a pattern and what comes in the right side is uh, the value that we are doing the match. So I can do something like this, A, B, C, and here I can pass tuple. So in this case, it's gonna be trying to match this pattern with the values inside here. And then it's gonna be the structuring and now I have variables A, B, C defined. So I can really do simpler things like A, B, um, and C. So, and then it works one, two, three. And, and that's very powerful because uh, this syntax is useful to have multiple returns in a function and, and, and things like that. So yeah, this is a tuple. I, I don't, I'm not showing, but tuples can be mutable, right? I say that tuples are fixed in size, but you can declare mutable tuples if you want. And then you can like change, for, for example, tuple dot one is now no more one, but nine, nine. So it's possible. I'm not changing the size of tuple. I'm just, just changing the value that's inside it, uh, where uh, it's pointing. Uh, and this is confusing because in, in some languages, tuples are meant to be immutable, but Rust uh, allows us to do this. So actually what it's doing, it's turning all the i32s inside it mutable, but the tuple itself is fixed, right? So we, you can mutate the internal values and not the, the tuple itself. And also, if you try to change the tuple and put there like a a string, for example, it's gonna fail with type mismatch because if you start a tuple with this structure when changing, you can you need to follow the same structure to do the changes. You don't uh, you have to be really strict about typing and and, and structure of the the objects there, right? Uh, and following tuples, we have another uh, type that is also a compound type that is known as array. So array works very similar to a tuple, uh, but it's different in the way the memory is managed. So uh, arrays are stored on the stack memory. Uh, it's better in terms of like access. And the difference is that it uses square brackets. So I can create an array with one, two, three like this. Uh, and when I want to access a member of an array, I would do array. And instead of dot here, I use square brackets and like, let's take what is in the position zero and print it to the terminal. So here I got one printed here. So array looks like a list when you are working with other languages, but actually it's more uh, it's different because array has a fixed size. So once you start an array, you can't change the size of it. In this case, it's an array of three elements. I, I can never uh, put one more element here. And also it only allows a single type. If I try to put a string here, it's gonna error because arrays uh, is homogeneous. So uh, the type of this is an array of i32 with three elements, yeah? But again, I don't need to specify this by my own. Rust will infer for me. And also array supports the pattern matching for removing variables inside it. Array supports mutability and yeah, all, all the basic stuff is works the same way. The real difference is how the memory is managed here uh, on array. And talking about memory, Let's summarize because Rust is all about memory management. So I think this is the reason people start using Rust from the beginning. So let's take a look visually how it works in the memory. So I have this uh, uh, table here. I'll try to show you what happens when the program starts. And a disclaimer, this is gonna be like very higher level. I'm not going through the details, just like a very simplification on, on the 
on the on those details. Uh, what happens here is that uh, when the program in starts working, so when you run your Rust binary, you can have variables like using the static keyword, which is very similar to the constant. So I'll create here foo equals one. I need to say that foo is a U8, for example. If I use this static here to create a variable, what the Rust compiler will do is Rust compiler will, uh, when the program starts, it's going to be reserving a uh, space in the memory called static memory, uh, which is the code segment. The binary of the program will be stored in this place in memory. And together with the binary of the program, I can also put static variables if I want. So I can like allocate this static foo inside here. So um, there will be reasons for doing that instead of using constants. I will not enter into the details here, but um, this is um, interesting, especially if you are working with embedded uh, applications. Uh, so yeah. And if you are defining a string, like for example, I'll create a string here, will be just my name, Bruno. Um, the Rust compiler will also take this string, which we call string literal, or just str for short. And also the Rust compiler will take this and store this in the static memory. So it's gonna be easier to look up this uh, variable in the memory, don't need to do system calls, it's very fast. So there are all those kind of reasons. Um, this variable inside the function scope will also have a pointer in another place of the memory, so we can use it in the normal uh, function. Uh, but if I create all the primitive types I just showed you, like if I create here a number, if I create here a floating point, or if I create, um, I'm running out of letters, <laughs> uh, Boolean and so on, these variables are not going to be stored in the static memory. So what Rust will do here is uh, use another space in the memory called stack. So, uh, so what's the difference? The static is created with a fixed size when the program starts. So if I'm not wrong, uh, it's like two megabytes in Rust, uh, I think, or eight. I don't remember exactly. But the program binary is going to be loaded there, all the static variables and all the string literals. And this is fixed. I can't change these values, but they are very like fast to access. And, and all the values there will leave until the program ends. Like the lifetime is global. Uh, it's called the static lifetime. Uh, but there's this other place in the memory, which is the stack, which it will be created for every function. So uh, in this case here, I just have one function called main. So inside the scope of this function, there will be a stack frame for it. So there will be a space on this stack. The stack is also fixed in size. There is a limit. It starts with a value but there is an upper bound limit. All the function arguments, all the function local variables will be uh, stored there. And every thread, if you are running concurrently, will have its own stack. So all those three values here will be uh, stored on the stack. So Rust will take, take this, put here on a stack frame, which are um, really a stack. So it's gonna be pop pushing it on the top of stack and when accessing will be Popping it from the top of stack. This is for being like more um, fast to use. And uh, all the values that goes to the stack has fixed size. So we know that this case is i32. It has 32 bits. It goes to the stack. The uh, there is no need to do, for example, system calls, memory lookup. It's there in a fixed position. This pointer just points there, and it's very fast. So. Um, this is basically how it works. When the function goes out of scope, Rust will remove this whole frame from stack 
then all these variables are cleaned and everything is good. But let's say you are uh, assessing a database, right? So you go to a database and you go to your users and you do a query on that database. So you call get users function that is defined somewhere in your framework or program. This variable here will have a type. So in this case, it's going to be a vector of user, for example. So a vector is a, a kind of array, just like the one we saw before, but it's a dynamic array. So we, it doesn't have a fixed size. It can grow if you have more users. So you can have one, two, or one million users in your database. You just don't know in the compilation time. So how uh, Rust will store this vector variable? No, uh, it can't store this on the stack because the stack has a limited size. So what Rust will do is actually using another uh, space in the memory, which is called heap. So the heap memory is uh, organized in a different way. It can grow during the program runtime. So you can have one user or multiple users. It will uh, handle it uh, dynamically. It starts with uh, capacity, but it can grow in capacity. So for everything that is dynamic, we're going to use the heap memory. So in this case here, uh, this is going to be uh, having, in this very specific case, this variable users will be a pointer and this pointer will be stored on the stack, right? But just the pointer. The pointer will have the address to the real data, which is coming from the get users variable. And this real data here will be stored on the stack, on, on the heap, right? So uh, the variable users is just, you can use it inside a function normally, but it points to a value that is stored on the heap. And then, uh, yeah, you have dynamically. So whenever you are working with Rust, you need to understand where in the memory your value is going to be stored. So you can understand if you need like a fixed size array or a dynamic sized array, which is a vector. If you are working with a string that you don't want to mutate, you can work with a string literal, just like I did here. Or if you are working with something that's going to be coming from a user input, for example, on the terminal, you need to use another type that by the type system, you tell Rust to store this in a dynamic place in the memory. And all of this happens, uh, again, because of the memory management and memory save it. So you can have your program running very fast. So let me recap where I was here. Uh, this just have some kind of uh, showing exactly what is stored in each uh, place in the memory. I can share this. This is based on the actual Rust documentation information, but put in a in a, um, in a table. And then we can get back to our uh, code here and do something more interesting, right? Uh, I still have time for doing this. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, it's being recorded, so if you want to go ahead, you can. Okay. All right. Yeah, just to, to know if I'm, I, I'm used to like uh, use all my time on those starts. And then when I go to the final application, I don't have time anymore, but uh, let's try to do this faster. <laughs> so yeah, I talked about a little bit how Rust does things in memory. And I think the main parts of that is that if you have fixed size values, like integers, arrays, tuple, you know, those primitive types, this goes to uh, that place in the memory, the stack, and it's something that can't grow. And you need to know the size in the compile time. Uh, but let's create an application here so it's going to be easier to understand. This application is actually the same application that you found, find in the Rust documentation. I'll just go over it and trying to explain what's going to happen here. So we're going to create a guessing game. So what is a guessing game? The user will be typing in the terminal a number. And we're going to generate a random number. We're going to match those numbers. And if the user uh, guesses it right, we say that uh, 
uh, user wins. If the user guesses it wrong, we do other things. So I can show a little bit of control flow and how uh, you actually work with a program in Rust. So to start it, I'll be creating a function, right? So uh, to get input from the user on the terminal, I need to open a connection with the standard input. So uh, I get the, the text that is typed there. I'll create a function. Functions in Rust use the FN keyword. So I'll create a function called read user input. And this function will take S, which will be a string. And you see that this time I'm using a capital S string, right? So what is this capital S string? This is a string that doesn't have a fixed size. It's a string that's going to be living here on the heap memories uh, space. So when I use capital S string, string goes here. I can start, for example, with an empty string and concatenate it. It can grow in capacity during the program um, runtime. So as we are reading the terminal, I don't know how many characters the user will be typing. I will use this uh, because every time we need dynamically um, allocated data, we need to use those special types, right? Uh, and here inside this function, I'll just put a comment here. This comment is going to be a to-do. And here we're going to read input from terminal. We just will be doing this in a minute. Um, on the top of the function, we can also add comment, but this comment will be added with three slashes. You see that here, I use it two slashes, just like in C or JavaScript or other languages like this. But on the top of the function, on the line before the function definition, I can use three slashes and I can say that this function read console input and add to S. Just an example. Uh, this is what we call a doc comment. So this is going to be part of our project documentation. And this is just a regular comment of uh, ignore this line. We are telling the compiler to do this, right? Uh, so we get warnings here, but I can compile without problems. We can uh, Warnings are because I'm not using, but I can compile and I can run cargo doc dash dash open and it's going to open for me documentation. I'm opening here on my browser and you can see that for free, I have this documentation page embedded with the language. So I don't need extra tooling to create doc. I have the documentation for my main function, as you can see here, for my read user input function. And the text I place it there is here. So the text I place it with three slashes here are here. And it supports Markdown. So you see that this S is formatted using Markdown. So um, this is why every, almost every Rust library or program you have will have this very similar uh, documentation page. You can customize it, uh, but it, it's going to be looking very similar. Uh, and here we have more details. We can see the source code and you can make it runnable. So you can put like a play button here so user can run uh, the snippets uh, of the documentation. So it's very complete and a built-in feature of the language that helps a lot. So uh, besides that, let's go in and create our program. So I have this function that's going to be reading the user input. So I'm going to go to my entry point, my main function. And here, I'm going to print to the user and say to the user, uh, guess the number, right? So let's say we have a number that is randomly generated. And I'll ask the user to guess it. I'll create a variable called guess. And this variable will be a string with capital S, a string that is dynamically. To create a dynamic string, I have some options. One of them is calling a static method called new, which is like an initializer for an empty string. So I'll create this empty string. Uh, and my goal is to pass this empty string to this function. This function will go to the terminal and talk to the standard input, take whatever the user 
uh, types there and mutate as store there and give me back, right? And then I will call read user input. I will pass this variable guess. So variable the, the read user input will do whatever we want. And then I will just print here just to get started. Uh, you guess it or you type it, you type it. And then I'll put here the guess, right? If you are already program it in, for example, Python, you see that this is pretty straightforward. Like you have a function, you will receive a value on the function, you do whatever you want with that value, and then you use the value again, and that just works. But in Rust, this doesn't work this way, right? So let's learn why. And I'm showing this first because I think this is the most important feature of Rust. This is where Rust really uh, does all the memory safe it stuff in this feature I'm going to show. And this is where most people will be like confused. So if I try to uh, run it now, it's going to show an error for me. So the error says that borrow of moved value, yes. And then it's saying that it's on line 12. So you see here on line 12, I try to print guess. And it's saying that I can't because guess is no more here. So I don't have guess to print because guess has been moved to other place. So I cannot use. And then it, the compiler shows us exactly where it happens. So it shows me that on line 11, the value has been moved to the read user input function. And on line 12, I'm trying to use the value after it has been moved. Uh, so this is what we call ownership and borrowing. Like in Rust, you're going to see the name Ownership Borrowing Resource Management, OBRM. So uh, let me try to explain this because this is sometimes the most complicated thing in Rust, and I hope to find words to explain. We say that in Rust, every variable like this one I called guess is an owner of something, right? So this value I created here, which is an empty string, is owned by the guess variable, right? So this is an owner. Guess acquired this value. And in Rust, you can just have one owner for a value. So we are talking about this, an empty string allocated on the heap, heap memory. Uh, and this value can have only one owner. At this time, on the line 11, the owner is guess. However, when it, we call a function, read user input, this function has an attribute s. And function attributes is just like variable assignment. So for example, if I come here and say that s equal guess, I am passing the ownership of this value from guess to s. And at this point, uh, s is the owner, right? So you see, we can have only one owner for every value. So if I pass it the ownership to s, guess is not owning anything, so guess is invalid. So Rust doesn't have no pointers. So uh, a variable cannot point to the new data in the memory. So once we pass the ownership of a variable to another variable, the variable that was the owner is invalidated. So in this case, we are doing exactly this, but in the form of a function call. Because inside the function, every argument becomes a local variable. So this is just the same as I do, like s equals something here, uh, but in the function signature. So when I call the function, I am giving the ownership of guess to s because s is the argument inside the function. So I move the value to there and uh, guess is, is no valid anymore. So this is called move semantic. And uh, you're going to see this in other uh, lower level languages. Um, but it's really frustrating when you are starting with Rust and you see errors like this and you say like, yeah, this is very 
trivial to do. Like I just want to call a function, pass a value, and then use this value again. And I can't because the value has been moved. So how do we fix this problem? So to fix this problem, we need to understand this mechanism of ownership and borrowing. So the first rule is that uh, a value, or we can call this a resource, like because it's not just a value. It can be a pointer to a database. It can be a descriptor to a file system. So a resource can have only one owner, right? Um, and if I pass, depending on the variable, if I pass this as argument to a function, I'm going to be moving, especially if I'm talking with these types that are allocated on the heap memory, the value is moved to the function. Uh, so uh, instead of moving this value to the function, I can borrow it. So that's where the name comes. So instead, instead of saying to the read user uh, input that now S owns the value in the memory, I can just like borrow. The read user input can use this variable inside its scope. But when this function returns, then the borrow ends. And then the guess is still the owner of that variable and I can still use it. So how do you use borrowing instead of ownership passing? So to use borrowing, you need to specify on the function that you are accepting a reference. So ampersand means reference and the reference in Rust is a borrow of some value. So in this case, I'm not accepting uh, a type, but a reference to a type. And then when I'm passing this value to that function, I will also pass it with uh, ampersand. So then now I'm passing this as a borrowing. So uh, right now I can run it. You see that I don't have more errors, only warnings, but uh, that's why you see function calls with this ampersand. So you need to be aware when you want to really move a value or when you just want to borrow the value to the function or to the other scope to use it. And this depends on the type, right? So here I'm doing this with a string. So a string is something that is moved. Uh, but if I was talking about an integer, an integer, integer is not moved. An integer is copied to the function. So there are those details depending on the uh, memory allocation. Uh, but my advice is to read what the compiler says in the, in the message, and it's going to be clear there what you need to do, right? So, well, let's do what we want, which is read the user input here. So to read the user input, we need to use an external library. Uh, and this external library is called standard IO. So there is a standard library in Rust. There is a IO model. We can call this uh, use statement, which is just like an import. Uh, we are importing the IO model to this global scope. And now I can use it here inside this function, let's use it to read the uh, user input. So I'll say that let input equals IO, and I will call a method called standard input. And this will bring me an object of the type standard input. So uh, the type system is really important for Rust. So uh, whatever you call a function or um, you, you, you call a method, um, what you get back is not like the value you want. Most of the times you get a type that's going to be wrapping the real value you want. In this case, we get back this s to the in, which is uh, a Rust type. And this Rust type, there is a method. So now I can call input read line. And to the read line, I can pass the S. Uh, so then it's going to be doing uh, what we want to do. So in this case, I will try to run. And you see again that I have errors. So yeah, get used to that. Whatever you are coding in Rust, you're going to see errors lots of time. And in this case, it's saying that the type differ in mutability. And 
that's like something we can expect because if we, I want the user to type things in the terminal and I will read it and put this in the string I accepted here, this needs to be mutable, not something that is immutable by default. So to fix that, the compiler shows us uh, what we need to do, like try to put ampersand mut on the string and so on. So if you follow the compiler, you can fix this. So in this case, we are accepting a mutable string. And when it pass here, we are gonna pass this as a mutable string. So then we fix the problem. And now here, we need to do the same. So we need to start the guess as a mutable and we need to start to pass here as a mutable. And now we have this almost working. So now I can run it. Let me increase my font. And I have another problem. Um, cannot borrow as mutable because, let me show. Uh, what I'm missing. I'm missing something here. Oh, I, I just, it's already mutable inside the function. I just need to pass it here as like this. So S is a mutable uh, string. I read the values to that. Here I get a mutable string. Then I read user input uh, passing the mutable guess, and then I can type guess here. I hope it's all we need. Mm. Not really. Something I'm missing. <laughs> Let me refresh my mind here because I'm I'm doing from uh, without the help of the uh, the editor, uh, but it's okay. Yeah, input will be receiving the read line and passing the mutable s which is the variable I got here as a mutable. And then I can just read line on it. Yeah. Uh, it's not declared as mutable, but it's declared as mutable here. Maybe I just need to save it again and run it. Uh, that yeah, if I if I was using uh, VS Code, for example, uh, VS Code will be like telling me exactly on the line what I need to do to fix this problem. Uh, but let's recap. I'm getting the mutable guess, which is a string mutable, and I'm calling a function. Instead of passing this as ownership, I'm just borrowing. So I'm passing as a reference. So here I have a uh, mutable guess being uh, passed there. So that's okay. And here I'm accepting this as a mutable string. I get the standard input and I read the line here. Uh, I think I don't need it. So, oh, now I got it. I think, yeah, let's go. Uh, sorry, now it's working. It was just a warning, not an error. So, okay, uh, here, as I'm already receiving this as a mutable, I don't need to declare as a mutable again because this variable is already the mutable variable when I uh, pass this to the function, right? So now you see my terminal is in a prompt and I can type a number here. I'll type 99, enter, and then it just shows you type 99. So you see, that's how we read values from uh, the user and the user can type any kind of thing here and I just read it as it's dynamic. I can't uh, know before compilation uh, the size I need to use this string because it's going to be allocated in the heap memory, right? So we still have problems here. Uh, that's why I was confusing uh, because we have uh, warnings and the warning is telling me that it's working, but it's not very like uh, working in a good way because in this example here, this input read line is returning a value for me and I'm not using this value. So whenever we have something returning 
uh, something. Rust will uh, tell us to do something with the return. So read line returns a result. And result is a type in Rust that's very important. It's a wrapper where we can put values and errors. Um, and in this case here, we can simplify this function. And actually, we don't need this function because what we are going to do here is very simple. I created this function just to show you that thing on passing. Uh, but to figure out this problem, we really don't need to have this function here. What we can do is just like remove this function and do the thing we need here. Instead of calling user input here, I can just call IO estadin. And then here I can start calling uh, a thing called combinators. So combinators is like a functional programming style where I can uh, break the line and call chained methods over uh, some result. So this is returning for me a type called estadin. This type has a method called readline. So I can call readline here. Uh, in this case, I can pass to the readline guess which should be mutable this time. So I'll pass as a mutable. Uh, this time I need to pass because I, I don't have the function to define it on the uh, signature. And what this is going to return to me is something called result. And inside this result, I'm going to have two possibilities. One is called OK, and another one is called error. So now uh, it, this is another thing in Rust that is different on many languages. So in most of the cases, when you call a function or a method like this one, what you get in return is not the value. So it's not like the user type it here, 99 on the terminal, and you get here on the read line, just the 99 as a, a text, right? That's not what, what happens. What happens is that Rust will wrap the function return in a type and we call this some types or uh, monadic types, depending on the language you are working. Uh, in Rust, it's called, res there are two of them. One is result, other is option. Uh, but what it does is it creates a wrapper and the wrapper is a enum. The enum has two variants. One variant is okay when everything works and another variant is error when we have a failure. So, we don't have try except in Rust, so you can't like work with exceptions the same way you do in other languages and, and, and control flow uh, based on exceptions. You need to control flow based on these return types, and then you match on these types to decide what's your next step. So in this case, specifically, if I type 99 on the terminal, it's going to be building a result. And if the type, I the if it's able to read, it's going to create a variant called OK, and we'll put 99 inside this. So this is what I get in return of that function. If there is a failure, then it's going to be creating this. Uh, if I'm not wrong, there will be an IO error here or something like this. And then there is going to be the message for the error, and then I can treat. So I have a type. There are two variants of that type. One is OK, one is error. So uh, what we need to do in this case, we need to unwrap the value. We need to take this value and remove from inside. So one other way of doing this is calling unwrap. So unwrap is going to take whatever is inside that result. If inside the result there is a value, it's going to get us the value. If there is an error, it's going to panic and, and our program stops, right? Uh, but unwrap is not like something we usually do. We have other methods to help us. One of them is called expect. Expect allows us to provide a very meaningful message like you um, error reading terminal. We can pass any message we want here. And actually, there are other ways we do this, uh, but it, this is the, the most common. So you see now the program is very like uh, simpler. We, we call this, we get here. Uh, Result, if everything is OK, uh, we get the OK branch. If there is error, we get the error branch here. And then 
if there is an error, this expect message goes to the terminal. If there is no error here, we get the final result we want, and then we can print here. So again, in this case, I can run. I don't get any warning this time. And then the user can type, for example, 99, enter, you type at 99. So uh, yeah, so that this part is working, right? So we have almost our guessing game uh, working. We are able to read user input from the terminal. What is missing from a guessing game? So the next step is user types something on the terminal, and then we want to compare this with a random generated number. Uh, so we see if the user wins or fails. So for doing that, we need to open that other file called cargo.toml. Um, this file is the package, has the package information. Oh, I opened the wrong file actually. It's cargo.toml. Oops, not this one. Cargo terminal, and here on the dependencies we can list external libraries that we want to use. So uh, Rust doesn't have a built-in functionality to generate random numbers. So for doing that, we need to use a crate. What is a crate? So crates.io is like npm or pypi for Python. It's where all the Rust packages are published. And there is a crate called rand, which can generate random numbers in different strategies. And I think this is the most used one for doing this. And this is how we use it. So we put this specification in the cargo, like exactly which version we want to use. And then uh, we are able to um, bring that crate to our program. So I'll install exactly this version here. So I have the new dependence added. And what I need to do is to call cargo install here. Oh, cargo run. And then the next run, cargo will talk with the crates.io, fetch this dependency, and now I can have it on the program to, to use. So I'm gonna list all the dependencies here. It uses semantic versioning, just very similar with other uh, language does. So now I can do this. I can come here and do use rand, the name of the crate that just installed it. And inside there, I'm going to take this object called RNG. And RNG gives me the ability to uh, generate the, the random number. So I'll generate the, name, the random number here on the top uh, after the user type it. Let me do this here. So uh, let number equals. So now we're going to use the crate rand. Uh, we're going to call a method there called thread RNG. So as I said, we have different strategies to generate random numbers. So in this case, I'll do this. Generate in a range specific. And here I pass a slice, uh, uh, start and end of the, the range I want to generate. So I will, just to be simpler, I'll generate numbers from 1 to 100, 100 included. And then this is going to be generating a number for me. Um, the type of this um, number will be, and as it's 1, it's starting in 1, not negative, it's going to be uh, U32 or U16. Uh, but we can see this. Uh, later, we don't need to, to care about this now. And I'll print here just for the sake of debugging. Uh, the number is, and then let's print the number, the random number here. And then we can compile. And you see it generated number 44. And then user will type like 44. If it's a match, we say the user wins. Very simple. Let's keep this for debugging here. Uh, after we can remove and let's continue with the next thing on the program. So, hey, Bruno. Yeah. Um, how much longer do you think you have? I would just do this comparison and I think everything is okay. But if you are, you think we are oh, no. out of let's, time, we can go to the Q&A. Okay, no let's do another five minutes and then we'll do the Q&A. All right, for me, so it's perfect. Uh, awesome, great. 
Thanks. Awesome. All right. Yeah, so let me go strictly to the important things here so we don't lose lots of time. So uh, one important thing in Rust is that Rust doesn't do type coercion, as we saw before. Uh, so when I type in the terminal numbers, it's going to be read as a string, like string type. And I need to do comparison. I need to see if the number generated by the rand crate is equal to this. Uh, to be able to do this, I need to do the conversion by my own. So uh, to do this conversion, I can like shadow this variable. So after I read it from the user input, I can say that the guess variable will need to be U32. So I use the very same type I have here so I can compare those two. And then I say like, I want whatever user type it in. I want a trim, so trim is to remove uh, empty from the beginning and the end, just like the strip in Python. Um, then we're gonna use parse, like parse is uh, the function that does the type inference. So if parse finds something that looks like an integer, it's gonna part as an integer, find something that looks like a uh, Boolean and so on. But in this case, we are helping parsing because we are already specifying the number here, u32. So parse will try to take the string type it here and convert this to u32 uh, to store here. And in this case, parse will also return a result. And this result will have OK if everything works good and error if it was unable to parse. So in this case, we need to treat this error. So uh, we can treat the error the same way we did here above, just calling dot expect. And if the user uh, types something that cannot be converted to a number like text, we just print this to the terminal. But we can do better things here, like um, we can use pattern matching and um, we can use um, more um, complex let operation. So in this case, what I can do here, just to show you how match works, um, match works just like an if statement, uh, but uh, instead of doing by value, it can also work by structure and other things. Uh, but it's also an expression, so I can match over this value. And then I can inside this uh, block here, I can work on the possibilities I have. So one of the possibility I have here is if it's OK. So if it's OK, there are no error. I can take the number from inside it. And I can just return the number. And the number will be assigned here to the guess. Uh, if it's an error, then I use the variant error. And then I don't care about the error. So I just put underline. And then in this case, I can do something like println and then tell the user something like uh, type invalid number, for example. And then this is uh, a pattern match, right? Uh, I have a syntax error here. Now, um, yeah, so another thing that is important is that um, the return type here is U32, as you can see. So here, I can only return i32s. So there are ways to uh, to figure out if I'm inside a loop or something. But in this case, I cannot like just print to the terminal because I'm not returning anything to be stored. So in this case, I can, uh, for example, create a new block here to put more code inside it. And uh, instead of returning, I can just like panic, which is like uh, if I panic, I will be like erroring my program. And in this case, uh, I'm doing exactly the same as expect, but using a pattern match. So if user types something that's not valid, it's going to be saying that there is a panic that happened and invalid number is passed here, there. So this is one of the ways we can treat errors in Rust. There are other better ways to do it, of course. Yeah. Uh, but as, as we are out of time, I will just show the complete program working. So if someone wants to know uh, what I was trying to reach here, is this. So you see, um, we did this random number generation. We get 
an empty string. We read uh, the input from the terminal on there. Uh, then we try to parse uh, the number. If the number is okay, we just store it. If there is an error, we continue. And then we are inside a loop and we let the user try again and type this how many, many times the user wants. And here, instead of using an if statement to compare if the number is higher or lower than the typed number, we use a pattern match that can work on the fixed types. So again, you see that the typing system is important because to do this comparison, we use the Zenon that has three variations. If the number compared to the other number is less, we print this and so on. So let's just show you how it works. So uh, right now I don't have any hint. So if I type, for example, 50, it's gonna say it's too small. I need a bigger number, six, five. Yeah, I guess it in the second, uh, too small. So I need this too big. And then we can keep trying like it's seven, four, maybe seven, three. Yeah, and then I, uh, and, and you can really calculate how many tries you need here. So that's a very good exercise. And again, this exercise is on the Rust book. Um, I went through the exercise a little bit different than the Rust book because I wanted to show you specifically how the ownership works. So that's why we ended creating more functions. Yeah, but I think that summarizes what I wanted to show you, uh, the basic, uh, functionalities of Rust and how, why Rust is um, a language that gives us memory safety because of all those constraints. You see that many times we end up with an error in the compiler if we try to do things that looks trivial in other languages that we are used to do. But Rust we, will try to push us to do the right thing in terms of memory management and also in terms of code styling so we can have our code more like readable and, and, and safer. Yeah. And now I think uh, we can go to the Q&A because for sure I use it all the time I had. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start reading some of the questions, but you may have answered them. So if you did answer them, I guess maybe you could re-answer quickly um, because it's from the beginning. The first is, does Rust know the variable type without the need for definition like int or float, just like Python? Yeah, it does type inference for most of the variables. Let me open another tool here uh, in this terminal so I can show you quickly. Uh, there is a tool called iRust, which is just like an IPython, uh, which is a terminal. So for example, I can do let x equal 34, and then uh, Rust will do type inference. Then here I can ask for the type of s, it's integer. So I don't need to define as, as an integer, Rust will do the inference for me. But if I want, I can specifically say that this is an i32 and I shadow that variable and the type is going to be i32. Yeah, so there's type inference in most of the cases. Some cases you need to specify, like in the function arguments, you need to specify structures and, and so on. Yeah. Next question. Um... What is your experience on Rust? What do you use it for? Yeah, so I work on Red Hat on the Ansible project. Ansible is Python, 100% Python. Uh, so for the project I work on, on the company, I almost don't use Rust. Uh, but we use Rust to create small things, small libraries or tooling. Uh, and we do that because it's very easy to compile and distribute the binary without the need to create environments on the target system. So whenever you need a tool that is fast and need to run, uh, we tend to try to write this in Rust. So in my experience, I have written some testing libraries, testing uh, runners in Rust, and I've been exploring Rust for the past five or six years. And I've been doing some open source. So there is a Python library I created called DynaConf. I ported it to Rust. So there is a Rust version of it. So that's where my experience and usage of Rust is. Mainly working on command line application and also uh, web applications using Actix, which is a framework for creating APIs. 
Yeah, so next question is, does Rust syntax support I values and R values like in C++? Uh, the support what? R values and I values. R values and I values. It I think be, I... It might be L values. I don't know. Is that something, L values? Yeah, I don't understand. I know that like... Maybe that's too much specific on C or C++, something that I don't know about, but Rust supports smart pointers. So uh, I think uh, I think it supports, but I need to, I actually, I don't understand the question, <laughs> to be honest. Okay. The next one is differentiate between a macro and a function. What exactly is a macro? Okay, so uh, function is something we define like I did before, I have here a function like function foo, and I create this function, and this function receives arguments like x, i, 32, and I do things inside this function. So I can call this function easily, like inside my main function, doing like foo and passing a number here, and that's okay. Uh, so function is something that the compiler will do exactly what I want. So I define the function like this, and this is what the compiler will compile for me. Uh, macro is a pre-compilation hook that we can put in, in, in the compilation flow. So before compiling the end program, the uh, Rust will expand the macro. So um, let me find a way to show you this quickly. I hope it's going to be clear and I think I have the tooling I need. So if I do here println and I do hello word, um, this is a macro, not a function. Um, I'm missing a quote here. Yeah. So it has the exclamation point here. And this is like a syntax sugar because to print to the terminal, we need to acquire other libraries. We need to get from the IO library, the standard output, and then write to the standard output. And I could create a function to do that, but that function will be very specific. And in, in this case, the macro can print uh, text, can print numbers, can do variable interpolation. So the macro is a magic that uh, the, the compiler will expand during the, the pre-compilation and the end result of the macro will be, in some cases, a function. So there is a, a tool, I think I have it is installed, which is called Cargo Expand. The Cargo Expand will be showing me the underlying code. So you see, this print ln here actually is something that before the compilation will expand. And the actual code is this. You see, it's very verbose and not readable. So I need standard IO. Under print, I need to pass a core formatter. And I need I have versions of this. I need to pass uh, the thing I want to print. I need to pass the file I want to print in, which is the standard output. So instead of writing this very verbose code, uh, this boilerplate, I just use a macro, like an alias to this thing. Yeah, I, I hope it, it's clear. And we can create our own macros. So let's say you have some operation that verbose. So you need to create multiple things and call multiple libraries and, and objects. And, and then when you call it, you want to make it very concise, very readable. You can create a macro that during compilation will expand to the real thing. And the difference between a function is that when you expand the macro, this is the actual code. So you don't need to pay the price of calling a function doing a function call, allocating uh, the stack memory for a function. It's just code that's going to expand in your binary application and be very performatic. Yeah, that's it. OK, and the next one is, what is the difference between Go and Rust garbage collector? Please comment about the Discord use case where they refactored some services from Golang to Rust. And it is related to this other. So let me just read it so that you answer both of them. Uh, what are the advantages do you think Rust has over other languages such as Golang and Python? Yeah, so, uh, well, I've been working with Python for like almost 20 years. I really like Python. 
And I think one of the things that Python is like dangerous is that Python is too dynamic. Python allows us to do anything we want. We have ways to hack the Python import system. We have way to put hooks in the Python exception system. We can do good things with Python, but we don't have too much control of what we are doing. So it's easy to do the wrong thing and end with memory leaking. Uh, uh, Python has a, a global interpreter lo locker that helps a lot, but in many cases, sometimes you create applications that uses more mem memory that, than you really need. Uh, so uh, currently with MyPy and all the typing around Python, it's getting better. So you can create more safer and concise applications with Python. Uh, but yeah, Rust brings this level of uh, constraints. So you see that you need to do things really in the way Rust expect to be like safer and correct. So I think this is the advantage. And the syntax is not too different. If you see this function main, it's it's very similar also in the styling decisions with how Python community does. So uh, people that are used to write Python will be very familiar with Rust uh, because it even in the type system, when we start working with traits, it's similar to the Python data model. So that's very, uh, welcoming. And the difference between Rust and, and, and Go, I think, is Rust is more, I can say, tended to be in a lower level. So I can say that Go is used on all the networking things, and, and it's very nice language. But Rust tries to get, get a more radical uh, approach on memory management. Uh, Rust doesn't have a garbage collector, so you see those things I showed, I tried to show here about ownership, borrowing, and so on to solve the problem of memory. Uh, and Rust takes the garbage collector approach, uh, which is nice, but in some certain cases, we we'll have overhead. And the Discord case is uh, a, a good example. Discord, I think they were running the notification system or something like this. And Every 30 seconds, the garbage collector blocked the application to run and they needed to rewrite in Rust so they uh, don't have this problem. But yeah, I can't say one language is better than the other uh, because Go has things that are nice uh, for concurrence, for community and the use base. Uh, but Rust is also uh, good for all the usages you see in Go. So at this point, I think it's a matter of uh, taste, if you like more Go or Rust, and also a matter of the specific solution you are trying to write. So if you really need something that is safe on the memory level and fast without paying the cost of the garbage collector, I think Rust will be uh, better on that case. Yeah. yeah, and then would you say Rust has more informative error messages compared to some other languages? Yeah, I think I haven't seen other languages with this kind of informative error messages. And Rust is improving in the new version 1.65, uh, has even better uh, error messages and always trying to teach you uh, the next step. So I see that Python recently on Python 3.9, if I remember correctly, improved the error message system and is trying to get more uh, in this kind of style. So. Uh, yeah, so I think r this is one of the bigger features of Rust. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and then our last question is the Polas data frame uh, uses Rust with Python. Uh, the benchmarks between this and Python data frames are huge. Why is there so much difference? And do you think more open source projects will start implementing with Rust plus Python? Yeah, so I think the polars, if I I remember correctly, they are using, um, when you use pandas to do data frames, I think pandas uses libraries behind the scenes that are written in C or C++. And this code is like very dated and, and something that is stable and use it across multiple data science libraries like Psyche, NumPy, and so on. And I think on Polars, they rewrote something in Rust using a different approaches and all the memory safe it um, of, of Rust. So it tends to be faster. I don't know if it's feature parity 
uh, maybe Polaris is missing something, but it's going to be faster because uh, there will be no garbage collector. The memory management will be uh, very safe and, and, and constrained. And also uh, in, in the case of, of Rust, there will be no runtime. So you don't need to link multiple libraries to, to get it running. It's just a binary that you can plug in your uh, application. And I see other open source projects doing it. I can mention Pydentic. Pydentic is a schema validation library that is the base for fast API, for example. And Pydentic version two is written in Rust, but you can consume it from Python. So just import Pydentic, but the thing is written in Rust. There is the Tomel library. Um, I think it's called Rtomel that is also written in Rust. We have a JSON parser written in Rust. So we have many Python libraries trying to get this approach, especially when they need to do heavy and, and things where you really need uh, safety around memory usage. Yeah, so that was our last question. And um, oh, I'm oh, sorry, I'm just going to ask a question. Um, OK. Um, you might have sort of touched on it, but we talked um, earlier before the webinar began about how different, for instance, PyMC is writing some code in Rust and then importing it as a library within Python. Um, do, you, do you want to talk a little bit about that if you haven't already? Oh, yeah, I haven't. Uh, so um, there is something called FFI, which is Foreign Function Interface. You can compile software in C or C++ and use in Python or Ruby or JavaScript. Other languages can do this. And the Python community was used to write this in C or Cyton or other implementations. And Rust has a library called Py03. Yeah. I don't know where this name comes from, but this is the name Py03. And in Py03, you can, for example, create a function. Let's say I create a function called foo here. Uh, all the code, all the types I have here is Rust and it's running using all the memory safety of Rust. But the fact is, in this function, I can receive a special argument, which is of the type Python. And from this argument, I can have access to the Python interpreter. So inside here, I can call Python libraries. I can uh, instrument Python in some ways. And then I have here on my application uh, I don't remember exactly because I'm doing this by my memory, but here on the main function or somewhere else, you're going to like register uh, or export. I don't remember exactly what you do. I did this many times, but I don't remember. And then you're going to register this like this full function. I'm going to say that on Python, it's going to be called bar. And then I compile it. It's going to generate a binary. I put this binary on my Python environment. I install there or I put on inside my project. And then when I'm on Python, I can just go and do from uh, the name of my project, import bar. And then this thing here is actually a function implemented in Rust. So the way, the ergonomics of doing it is very easier compared to the way we, we do with other languages. Because this library, PyOtree, uh, abstract everything for us. So it's not too difficult to uh, create, take your existing Python project, take a function or a part of it that's taking too much time to calculate or doing things, and then just write that little part in, in Rust and export it. And, and that's because I think all those projects are, are starting to use it. Yeah. And sorry, this is not accurate. I don't know if this is the correct syntax, uh, but the idea is something like this, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's it. Great. I'll, I will let Beryl, thank you so much. I will let Beryl close it out. OK, thank you. Yeah, sh sure. Mm, thank you, everyone, for joining our webinar. It's good to see that you still have a good number of people here. And thank you so much, Bruno. Your talk has been very uh, enlightening. We've learned a lot. And as we said, this video will be posted on our YouTube channel in the next 24 to 48 hours. We will also include uh, some links to resources that uh, we would ask uh, Bruno to provide uh, anything that he thinks is important. 
So yeah, if we ever want to talk about trust again, we know who to go to. And thank you so with, with that. Uh, the webinar is over. Feel free to leave. And thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you.